Lord, I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So now Yusuf alayhi salam is taken to Egypt, and this is where I'm going to start today's continuation. Yusuf alayhi salam was put for sale in Egypt. And subhanAllah, remarkably, and this is from the will of Allah, as you can see, there is a plan happening over here. Guess who bought Yusuf alayhi salam? He was not a normal person. He was a man who had among the highest positions, in fact, if not the highest position, third highest position before the Pharaoh. In Egypt, they had Pharaohs at that time, the king Pharaoh. And the man who bought him was the minister of the Pharaoh. He was the treasurer of the land. He was the one who took care of all the financial affairs of the whole country where things go, what to do, how to pay people. He, he, took, he, he looked after everything. The minister of the Pharaoh. And he had a wife. They say her name was Zuleikha or Zulikha. The problem was that this man, the minister, he was a good man. But he was impotent. He couldn't have babies. He couldn't actually have any intercourse at all. Not only babies, he couldn't have intercourse. So he couldn't be with a woman. And his wife, she was basically called Imra'atul Aziz, the, the, the woman of the Aziz. Knowing that, the, you know, scholars tell us that she was called Imra'atul Aziz, the woman of the Aziz, because they knew that the man was impotent. Otherwise, she would be, maybe have been called Zawjatul Aziz, the wife of the Aziz. But she was called Imra'atul Aziz. So scholars say that she was still chaste. She was still chaste, still a virgin. And therefore, we'll see what happens later on with her. What happened here was that Al-Aziz bought him. And the reason why he bought him was because he, didn't, he couldn't have any children. He said to his wife, uh, Let's buy him. Maybe he'll benefit us in some way. Or we can adopt him as our own child. As you can see here, these thought processes and these things that are occurring are really out of the norm. There is a plan that Allah is putting into place. But Yusuf alayhi salam is yet to see the pain of it all, the hardship of it all. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى Again, he repeats it twice. With every one hardship, many eases will come out. And then Allah repeats it again. With every one hardship, many eases will come out. We have to be patient. One hard thing happens to you, be patient. Allah is going to bring out many good from it. we just got to be patient. This is our test. So now Yusuf alayhi salam has become the servant. He became a slave after that, not as a son but of the Aziz, the minister of the Pharaoh, and this noble woman. Noble as in, to her people, she was famous. She had a very high authority. And she was youthful, she was young, and she was actually very beautiful. The wife of the Aziz. Everybody respected her. She had a very high status in society. And very wealthy. And very powerful. Power, beauty, and wealth. And, she, and he was her slave. What happens here is that Allah says in the Quran a remarkable verse. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. وكذلك مكنا ليوسف في الأرض ولنعلمه من تأويل الأحاديث والله غالب على أمره. وَاللَّهُ غَالِبٌ عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ 
which means thus did we establish Yusuf in the land that we might teach him the interpretation of stories, of dreams. And Allah has full power over his affairs, but most of the people do not know. We establish Yusuf in the land means we, he was well looked after his master, by his master, and Allah gave him a very good dwelling. He had a firm foot. This is the plan. Allah made him a slave, but the reason, look, he put him with a master so that he can have a firm foot. He's safe, he's looked after, he's pampered, but he's a slave. Nobody disturbs him. In the meantime, Allah is teaching him. And this is a lesson for us, especially as parents or as individuals. When you want to study or you want to learn or educate your children or yourselves, brothers and sisters, avoid distractions and focus on what you're learning and complete it to the end. This is a weakness in a lot of us. We need to complete our actions to the end if it is good. Because the Prophet وسلم, says, Allah loves a servant that when he doesn't act, he does it to its fullest. So do your acts and don't get into distractions. And the biggest thing that we have to focus on in this life is our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learning our deen and why we have been created here. And all the worldly knowledge that we get is in order to serve our deen, to serve our way of life, to help us in this journey. So Yusuf alayhi salam was put there in the school. The teacher or his, uh, his, his teacher was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jibreel alayhi salam was bringing the information to him, teaching him the miracles of learning dreams and other information of the unseen. In the end Allah says, and Allah has full power over his affairs, but most of the people do not know. When Allah wants something to happen, brothers and sisters, He creates means, He creates the means, and then guides you to them. Like he, when Allah wants something for you, He starts, things happen in front of you, and, and you're sort of, you find yourself going into them, like you're steered into them. Rely on Allah and be patient, inshaAllah. Go with the flow, inshaAllah, and rely on Allah. Avoid the haram as much as you can. Do the good as much as you can and go with the flow. Some of us, we may plan in a certain way. And our plan doesn't go the way we want it. So Allah steers us away. There is probably something good in that. And this is why our Prophet ﷺ tells us, when a bad thing happens to you, to a believer, you should rely on Allah and be patient and say the following words. قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ Allah has decreed and what He wills, He does. This means that you put your... Will in Allah, your, your reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that you know that something good is going to come out. And Allah says in, in the hadith al Qudsi, He says, Ana inda husni dhanni abdi bi. I am the way my servant assumes of me. So if you assume of Allah good, good is going to come out. If you assume of Allah bad, maybe that is what's going to come out. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Tafa'alu bil khayri tajidu. Always be optimistic, you will find it in your way. Here is Yusuf alayhi salam falling into these what we would think disaster. A slave now away from his family as a child. Yet his patience is in Allah. And Allah says here, He makes the means to put the person into them when he wants something to come out. So brothers and sisters, this is qadr. This is the predestination of Allah. Subhanahu. When he wills something, you have to submit to it. When it happens, submit. And be patient. Work with it. If you can do something about it, do it. If you can't, rely on Allah and be patient, for it is a test for you. When is it a punishment? When the bad thing happens to you and you become impatient. That means you know that this is a punishment from Allah. But if you are patient with what happens to you of negative or bad, then know that this is actually a test for you. A test. Some scholars, they used to say the following words of the past. I'm talking about the children of the, ch of the companion's children. They used to say, Oh Allah, if what you have afflicted me with, if what you have afflicted me with is a test for me, then try me more. You will find that I am patient. And if what you have afflicted with me, with me with is a punishment, then I yield to you in repentance. I ask you to forgive me from the bottom of my heart. So strange is the matter of the believer. If good happens to you, you are patient and you are thankful. You are thankful. If a bad thing happens to you, you are patient. And you are still thankful. This is the way the believer lives his life or her life. Rather than losing it at your wife and the wife losing it at her husband or at their children. When the calamity befalls them. This is a trial from Allah, ya Abdullah. Servant of Allah, this is a trial. Allah is making you go through a journey. Will you pass this test? 
Allah says, we shall try you and test you. And in the end of it, in the end of this verse, I'm skipping a few words, Allah says, give good tidings to the sabirin, to those who are patient, give them good news. And then he says, the angels descend upon them, making forgiveness for them, asking forgiveness for them. So this is where the test lies. The next thing that happens to Yusuf alayhi salam is remarkable. And I'd like the young people here, not very young, not the children, but maybe the teenagers and the, the ones who are, you know, still in their youthful age. If you're over 40, then forget about it. But if you're between somewhere between the age of maturity and 40, okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. Even people after 40 can experience what just happened to Yusuf alayhi salam. If you are handsome enough. What happened? You understand why I said if you're handsome enough. The next thing, next thing that happens to Yusuf alayhi salam is, the, is one of the main lessons here. Allah says in the Quran, and when he attained his maturity, some scholars say 40, <laughs> but I think it's less. Because you'll see in the next verses that come, he was actually younger. When he reached his, his maturity, meaning his brain was full, his wisdom was complete, his body had reached its physical strength, and his beauty had reached its climax. It's, 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 the, it's the actual, that's how, you know, his absolute beauty in every form. Allah says, we gave him wisdom and knowledge. So Yusuf alayhi salam, like all the other prophets, they were in extraordinary in their wisdom. They knew what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. At the right time. They said the right thing at the right time, did the right thing at the right time. And they knew how to go about it. This is absolute wisdom. This is wisdom. Say the truth when it benefits, hide the truth when it doesn't. What to do in this circumstance? You can even lie if it means bringing people together, for example, and this is wisdom. But how you do it? When to be patient, when not to? This is all wisdom. Allah says, and thus we do reward those who do right. Yusuf salam's right thing here was that he persevered, struggled, and was patient and relied on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says he rewarded you. This means, brothers and sisters, that any one of us who is patient, persevering, relying, reliant upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will reward you with things in this world that you least expected. It's not wealth. It's not, uh, you know, some kind of fame and fortune, but rather it's the inner beauty, the inner fortune. And that is wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge. It is through knowledge that you are able to build and develop and become knowledge. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Those who know and those who don't know. Can they be equal? They can't be equal. Those who know and those who don't know. Those who know will stay away from the harm. Those who don't know will fall into the harm. I used to have a teacher who says to me, there's two types of people. There's the smart person and the foolish person. And they both, but they both learn from mistakes. But one of them is smart because he learns from the mistakes of others. He doesn't fall into himself. The foolish one has to fall into the mistake himself to learn. So they're the people who constantly fall again and again and again in order to learn. And some of them, well, it's not really foolish, but they're still smart, but less smarter than the other ones. A foolish person, actually, to correct myself, is one who falls in the mistake again and again and again and still doesn't learn. This person is a loser. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-mu'min la yuldagh, la yuldagh al-mu'min min juhrin marratayn. A believer does not get stung from the, snake, from the same snake hole twice. That means if someone does you over or you, a harm comes in your way or a mistake, you only do it once. A believer doesn't repeat the mistake twice. And at the same time, there are people who do sins. Allah says in the Quran, Allah will forgive your sins so long as you don't insist on repeating it over and over and over and over. But even after that, Allah will forgive until it comes to the point where you insist and you make a proper decision.
You make a commitment. But wallah, I come and say, oh Allah, forgive me. And in the back of my brain, I'm saying, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. So I do it again, I go, I'll just do the same thing. Which reminds me of something. In the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam, I forgot to mention that when the brothers of Yusuf wanted to throw him in the, in the well, you know what they said? They said, throw him in the well or kill him. And then after that, repent. After that, become better people. You know, a lot of us do that. This is the weakness of the human being. Say, look, you know, I know it's bad, but I'll just do it this one time. Afterwards, afterwards, I'll ask Allah to forgive me. Now, that's a, smart, that's a person who is all right. This is normal. But I'll tell you who the foolish person is. Is a person who's, who does it over and over, or a person who says, I'm still young. You know, when I'm 40, 50, 60, I'll go to Hajj. You know, I'll become a Khoja. And then after that, I'll start fixing my ways. I'm still young now. Wallahi, it kills me. It actually doesn't kill me. I feel sorry for these people that I go to do, I go to uh, solemnized weddings. I'm in a marriage ceremony for solemnized weddings. And when I'm there, I see different types of people. When you see the young girls without their hijab and their mothers who are 60, 50, 60, 70 years old, they've got their hijab on, mashallah, and their daughters are walking around without the hijab. Or you see young men who are lost and got funny haircuts, tattoos everywhere, or, or earrings here and there. And then their fathers have got big beards. And you say to them, subhanAllah, what's going on here? The young girls and young boys say to you, oh, you know, when I, when I get to my father's age or my mother's age, I'll start becoming a better person. Or even it kills me when some aunties or mothers, they say to you, oh, no, don't, don't, don't get my daughter to wear her hijab right now because she's still young. Otherwise, she can't get married. You know, she's got to show off her body. She's got to show off her hair. She's got to show off her body in order to get that husband. What kind of a husband is she looking for if she's doing that? What kind of a husband is going to... She's going to get a husband who has no ghira, has no jealousy over his wife. He's happy for everybody to look at her. What kind of a man is that? She is your, your, she, she is your, your trust. And if I'm happy to take, on, take this, this young girl into my life who you know, is, is very happy about showing off her body and showing off her beauty to other men, then what kind of a man am I? Am I? to want a wife like that, to share her around. Or a young man who says to himself, you know, I'll live my life as young, and when I become 50, 60, I'll repent back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you guarantee that you can even walk out of this masjid today and you're still alive? How? Look at your passports or your license. Is there a date of death on it? No. There is a date of birth, but you'll never find a date of death. You know why? Because nobody knows. Anyone in the world, no date of death. Anyone. No one can predict. I can't even guarantee wallahi right now that in five minutes I will still be breathing. Can anyone here guarantee that? No. So repent to Allah now. This is a great risk to say after, after, after. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Hadid, uh, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Which means, has it not come time for those who have gone away from Allah astray to come back to Him already? And not be like those who received the scriptures before. So they changed them and turned away from them. Until their hearts became hardened. And Allah does not give guidance to those who are truly corrupters. Their hearts became hardened. Meaning they kept going away. Delaying, delaying, delaying their return back to Allah. Until finally a disease entered their hearts. And their hearts became hard. And they could no longer open up to the love of Allah. They died on disbelief. And they died on corruption. The heart. Be careful, brothers and sisters, when you delay repentance, what happens to that? You are actually affecting your heart. It's like a cancer. You say, yeah, I've got cancer. I'm not going to go to the doctor until later. While the cancer is spreading in your body, it gets to a point where the doctor says to you, it's too late. We could have treated it maybe, maybe we could have treated it a few months ago, but you're too late. Like that. It's a disease of the heart. So we need to repent, brothers and sisters, immediately. So Yusuf السلام, was among those who did not delay his repentance, but his brothers did. Now Yusuf alayhi salam, what happened to him? Allah says in the Quran, وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَن نَفْسِهِ وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابَ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكَ 
قال معاذ الله which means Allah says and the one whom he stayed at her house meaning his master the wife of his master she entered the home locked the door and seduced Yusuf alayhi salam she said to him do whatever you want with me so you got a handsome man in front of her I want to just paint a picture for you here, brothers and sisters, so you can understand the intensity of this situation. You have a handsome man who is a slave. A slave means no one cares about his reputation, so he's got no reputation to lose. Number two, no one is to blame him. He's a slave. No one blames a slave. Number three, he's irresistibly beautiful. Number four, He's got a powerful woman before him who can protect him. Number five, she's wealthy. She can look after him. So if he does what she wants, he'll live like a king. Number six, she's beautiful. So she's attractive. Number seven, she's locked the doors and the windows. No one can see anything. So as they say, this is the perfect crime. The perfect crime. In the eyes, unfortunately, of the modern day world that we live in, this is the perfect, what? The perfect paradise. The perfect setting, the perfect paradise. Lustful, beautiful. You'd think that you're mad or insane if you don't do something with a woman in this situation. However, this is not a normal man. And at the same time, this is not a normal situation. So I don't want anyone to think, well, he's a prophet. I don't think you had a situation like his ever before. I don't think any of us will have a situation like that. Maybe halfway there, but not like that. So Allah gives every person a test in the way that they deserve it, in the way that is justifiable. So the prophets, Allah punished them worse than us and tested them triple, quadruple, ten times more than us. So then anyone say, oh, he's a prophet, I can't do what he does. The test for him was triple, double, quadruple than yours. However, this is an example for us. Allah forgives us a little bit more than the prophets. So he, there's a balance. She entered into the room and said to him, hey, talak. So number eight, she says to him, I'm all yours, do whatever you want. <laughs> Sorry for that expression, but this is the way it is. To tell you that every single opportunity with ease and lust and temptation is there. Hey, talak. And what did he say? <laughs> he said, I seek refuge in Allah. Yani, I ask Allah to protect me. It's not like someone's coming with a knife about to slit his, his throat. Nor is someone holding a gun to his head. Okay, that's when you would say, oh Allah, protect me, please save me. This is what you know. Someone's grabbed and throwing off the cliff and say, Oh Allah, save me. In this situation, Oh Allah, save me from what? From falling prey to lust. From committing zina. Not only that, he was so afraid of this heinous act that he said, he tried to plead to her, reminding her with her conscience, saying, Innahu Rabbi ahsana mathwai. Your husband, my master, he's looked after me. Please, don't make me do something to betray my master. He's been good to me. I don't want to be bad to him. Have some conscious woman. Have some brains woman. But she didn't agree. She chased after him. As she was about to grab him, Allah says in the Quran, وَاسْتَبَقَ albab." What a... He ra they raced to the door. On your marks, get set, go. They raced to the door. Who's going to get to there first? Yusuf salam wants to get to the door to escape. She wants to race him to the door to stand in his way so he doesn't escape. The opposite. La ilaha illallah. Allah says on top of that, وَاسْتَبَقَ albab وَقَدَّتْ قَمِيصَهُ مِنْ دُبُرْ She even managed to grab him by his shirt from the back. And she pulled him aggressively until she ripped his shirt. So there was an aggressive seduction here. 
Not by a woman to a woman, but by a woman to a man. A prophet of Allah. Does that exist today? Which men are like this today? Which youth are like this? Any of them left? You know, this person once said in front of friends, he said, you know, I've never been to a nightclub before. Everyone looked at him with shock. Because he said, I've never been inside of a nightclub. All of a sudden, a nightclub not being in there is a shock to everyone. Another one said, you know, I've never kissed a girl before. Everyone looked at him in absolute dismay. Not only in dismay, they thought he's a loser. And now they make uh, movies about, you know, men who are losers because they can't get women. And they call them wimps and they're cowards. How things have changed around. Where women have lost their absolute value, men have lost their value. And this type of behavior is considered to be noble and courageous. Allahu Akbar. You're a warrior. You're a hero. If you can serve your lusts and temptations. And then you have issues of rape and crime. And then you've got laws, especially in Western countries, that can't even solve anything. Just the other day I read in the paper about a man who was convicted in the court of law in Sweden. He was convicted of rape. You know what kind of rape? It says that the woman, she agreed to have intercourse with him. But, excuse me for the expression, he used some kind of contraception, I don't want to say its name, and the contraception broke. Based on that, she won in the court by claiming rape even with her consent. So now their own laws can't even solve their own problems. They bring more laws that bring more problems for them. And Allah says in the Quran, Allah wants to forgive you. وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَن تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا Those who follow their own lusts and temptations, they want to lead you astray, away, very far. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah wants to lessen the burden off your shoulders. He doesn't want, to, want you to fall into harm. He doesn't want you to fall into predicaments where you can't climb out of. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ These laws in our deen are only there to protect you. They are not there to cause you harm or restrict you, ya akhi. They are there to protect you because there's so much harm out there. Wa khuliqa al-insanu da'ifa. Allah also tells us, follow my laws because you're weak. You're weak. Pass them and follow my guidance. I'm there for you. Like what your father and mother do. To keep you away from fire, to keep you away from harm. They restrict you and place boundaries around you. We need boundaries from Allah, otherwise we fall into harm. And then there's AIDS. And there's HIV, and there is unwanted pregnancies by girls who are only 13 years old. 13, 12. 12, 13. And what happens to the child? They're put up for adoption. The child grows up without a father or mother. What oppression? What oppression? Only to repeat the same thing again and again. So there is great harm in this. And here we are, they're trying to tell you, youth, that doing these actions makes you a man. You want to become a man? I dare you to get married. I dare you to get married. Because to them, this is the most cowardly thing. They don't dare to get married, brothers and sisters. They don't dare to get married. I know of a friend who was sitting here among you, I don't want to point out to him, but he had a neighbor who was married to his wife for how long? As far as I can remember, maybe what, 20 years. They had children and in the end they divorced. They separated. <laughs> they didn't divorce, they separated in a de facto relationship. They were too afraid to get married. I had a neighbor. She had a three-year-old daughter. But they never got married, her and her partner. In the end, they left her for another woman. Obviously, he's going to leave you for another woman. He's too afraid to be a man. He doesn't want to get married because he's too deep in his lusts. And then turns around and she says, men, they're only after their ego. Of course. Why did you take a man like that? Allah gave us conscience. Allah gave us guidance in our brains to think with. And so Allah forbids us from these things because not to bring us harm. And you know what's sad? Unfortunately, 80% of the time, majority of the time, women are the victims. Women are the victims in this situation. So you can see it's reversed now. What does the man want? The man wants to use and abuse the woman. Use and abuse the woman. 
And you know what? If these young girls were able to look inside and read the, the, what's in the mind of young men these days, well, I don't think any of them, any of them will even hang around as much as 10 kilometers away from a man, close to a man. They wouldn't want to. But the men, they like to deceive women, wicked men. They like to deceive women, wicked men, non-God-fearing we're talking about. And then you get this poor woman who thinks that, oh, he's my boyfriend. We're going to stroll in. This is the image she has in her head. We're going to stroll in the park. He's going to pick up a, you know, a daffodil and give it to me. Or a rose. Hand in hand together. And then we're going to wait until the sun sets. And the birds chirping around us in this beautiful park. Poor thing. This is what she thinks, right? But the man is thinking about one thing. And he's going to tolerate all of that until he gets to it. I'm talking about men with diseases in their heart. And there are many of them today. With the uh, tabloid, with, the, with, the, with all the sceneries that you have out there. And all the things that are occurring. I feel very sorry for a lot of women. And I feel very sorry for a lot of men. Who have sold their youth and sold their chastity. Sold their dignity. To be so cheap. In the past... Arab girls here in this country, in Australia, in Sydney and in Melbourne, an Arab girl, only 10 years ago, was the most, as I, I'm going to use lame terms because this is what they say, she was the hardest to get, okay? She was the most difficult to get to. And all those other boys, they knew that. My wife tells me when she was back at school, the Arab girl, she was untouchable. And the Arab, the Muslim men, they used to always protect them. So they had ghira on their sisters in Islam. Wallahi, it is great sorrow. Only now, six years ago, oh, I've been going to Sydney back and forth and in Melbourne, and these are the stories I'm hearing. Our girls are out there throwing themselves at the men. Throwing themselves. And now the men are pushing them away. From where Allah put us, Put our sisters to where they become like trash, cheap, because she wants some attention. And I say, subhanAllah, to these men who pick on women who don't put their hijab. And they say, oh, it's her fault, it's her fault. You come to a man and say, well, it's her fault. This is some culture we have where boys are allowed to go out with the girl, do whatever he wants, because it's the girl's fault. Did you not know that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the man first? In relation to this type of religion, he says, he says قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ مُؤْمِنِينَ Male, masculine term. قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Tell the believing men to cover their gaze, to guard part of their gaze, meaning not to use their gaze too much. Then he says, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغُضُّنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ And then say also to the women, Believing women to guard part of their gaze. And to guard their chastity. And not to reveal their adornments and their beauty except to their husbands. Or to those whom they cannot marry. Like her father, her brother and other women. That's okay. In order to protect her own chastity. But Allah addresses the man first. So hijab actually applies to the man before the woman. Because hijab is not about a scarf on the head, Habibi. Hijab doesn't mean scarf. A lot of people who say hijab, oh, I'm going to wear the scarf soon. Ha scarf is not hijab, Habibi. Scarf is just covering the hair, not revealing the body and covering the hair. You see them walking out with tight clothing, mashallah, and then they got a, she's got a little scarf on her head, mashallah. They call it hijab. This is not hijab. Hijab is protection and veil. And for the man, there is a protection and veil. The veil is their behavior. And the man also has a modest dress code as well. But hijab not only is in clothing but also in behavior. In fact, there is a greater emphasis on hijab in the behavior and attitude than there is on clothing in the Quran and in the Sunnah, ya ikhwan. So much about talking about the voice, about the socializing, how far you can go, about the manner that you walk, the way that you seclude yourself, the way you, 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 you um, gaze at people, uh, the way you uh, present yourself. All of this is part of hijab. And clothing is only one little portion of it all. So my dear brothers and sisters, don't fool yourselves. Hijab to both areas. And that way you will guard yourself, guard your mothers, guard your sisters, guard your daughters, guard your wives, and guard yourselves. 
I know of uh, uh, some sisters who got fooled by the shaitan. They saw their brothers going out and doing what they want to do. And then what happens to the girl? As she grew up with her foolish, weak brain, and obviously with parents who don't know how to raise their children, she began to want to do what her brothers do. So she began to meet some girls who were corrupt, and she'd wait for the night. Her parents would think she's asleep and go out of her window with her friends until finally she was raped. And this is one incident out of many. But the other incidents are, because you see, she goes out, someone spikes her drink, and what happens to her? And some of them, they are convinced that this is what they should do. These girls think that this is what they should do. Allahu Akbar. They become slaves to society. Slaves. And they call hijab slavery? This is an independent woman who doesn't want all of that. She has guarded herself from all of this. Whereas the other ones, boys and girls, they have made themselves slaves to their lust, temptations, and the society. So I challenge you to get married and become a man. I challenge you. Yusuf السلام, was among those who beat his lust and desires. You know what she said? Well, they chased to the door. They raced each other to the door. She ripped his shirt. And subhanallah, the husband of the woman of Zulaikha, he happened to just suddenly enter into the house. He opened the door. Allah says, and they found her Sayyid, her master, again not calling him husband, she found her master at the door. Now he saw this running, you know, tearing off clothing. In that situation, he knew something was wrong. So immediately, the, 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 the woman of the Aziz, of the minister, she blurted out the following words. She said, what is the punishment of someone who seduces your wife? Except that you imprison him or give him a severe torture. She's very cunning here. I don't know if you realize what she's trying to do. She's trying to deter the minister's thoughts away from killing Yusuf a.s. Because in their laws, under the king's laws in that time, that whoever seduces the woman of a nobleman, he is put to death. She didn't want him to die because she felt guilty about what she was doing. And at the same time, she wanted to keep him for future opportunities. Now, this is the shaitan. And unfortunately, there are wicked women out there. And I'm not picking on the woman, but in this case, we are using this because the scenario has brought it up. That there are wicked women out there whom the Prophet ﷺ tells us to seek refuge in Allah from them. Fitnatun nisa the wicked plots of women who don't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Oh Allah, save us from the wicked plots of women. And these are the types of women who plot wickedly. The ones who listen to the shaitan. Because women, why did the Prophet ﷺ specify women here? Because I'll tell you something. And I, I asked our sisters to close, to close their ears because I don't want them to learn this. Then they'll use it against their husbands. <laughs> women are more successful it's statistically proven as well. Women are more successful in tricking the man than the man is in tricking the woman. This is actually true, statistically proven. The woman can lure the man more than what the man can lure the woman. She can trick him more. But if the man fears Allah and lowers his gaze, he can focus. And they say that in school, because I'm a teacher, they say that when they did a study on education, a class that's mixed with boys and girls, a class that's mixed with boys and girls, they found that the boys did, um, they, were, they, they, um, they were more distracted because they were ashamed. They were shy of the girls. So they were thinking, what's the girl thinking about me? Another study did show that the girls were more distracted because they wanted the, the attention of the boys. And they say that the study showed the boys were affected by the girls distractions more than what the girls were more than what the girls were affected by the boys distractions by their luring and it showed that the girls loved the attention and they could get it very easily uh, there was a boy who I was counseling and he said uh, a young Muslim boy he said I 
you know, unfortunately, I've gone into haram. I said, what's the haram? He said, now I have a girlfriend. I said, have you done anything? He said, no, alhamdulillah, I haven't done anything major, but minor. I said, you have to make your choice, akhi. And I gave him a bit of a da'wah. And in the end, he sat with the girl and said to her, Muslim sister, subhanAllah, he said to her, it's off for the sake of Allah. And if we really want each other, inshallah, in the future, we'll get married. She started to cry and bawl her eyes out. He came back to me and he said, after a week, he said, I'm back with her. I said, why? He said, she cried. I said, so what if she cried? They're always going to cry. He goes, but she cried really bad. And, and I felt really bad. I said, subhanallah, how weak we men are. A few tears make you, lured, lured you back. Alhamdulillah, after that, he did become stronger. Alhamdulillah, they cut off that relationship. Many others like that. Uh, a woman once uh, went to the court, uh, this is in the past Muslim world, and, he, and she complained about her husband wanting to divorce him. And she said, my husband is this and that and that. The judge said to her, I will only divorce him from you. This is a true story, but it's quite humorous. He said, I'll only divorce him from you if you can do one thing. She said, what? He said, you have to get me the hair of a lion. She goes, to divorce him, to get him out of my misery? Okay, I'll get you the hair of a lion. So she went and found where there was a lion and she began to trick the lion. Every day she'd feed him a bit, feed him a bit, feed him a bit until the lion was so full. And the lion became so full to the point where he didn't want to eat anything else. So when he became really lazy, she came closer to him and closer to him. When she started seeing that the lion wasn't eating any more meat, she came close enough to him and he didn't care less that she was next to him and took the hair off the chest of the lion. She brought the hair to the judge and said, here it is, now divorce me from my husband. He said, subhanallah, you could play a trick on the lion, but you couldn't play tricks on your husband to try and lure him towards you. <laughs> you know, he did this and that. Do something about it. Look what you did to the lion. So, <laughs> subhanallah, we can prolong our marriages, inshallah, in this sense. And I think that a woman can play a better role, inshallah, in luring her husband to her and winning the best of him. You know, in the Western world they say, and I don't say this is what you have to do, but just as an example, the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So feed him and get to his stomach. This is one way for some men. So find out and do so. So the woman, she said, what is the punishment of a person who seduces your wife except that a terrible punishment or imprisonment? So now they took him before to be tried. And Allah says in the Quran, that Yusuf السلام, had to spell out the truth. He said, She is the one that seduced me. So that's when he was put to trial. Okay, there's a difference here. Let's go to trial. Allah says in the Quran, وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ كَانَ قَمِيصُهُ قُدَّ مِنْ دبر من قبل فصدقت فصدقت وهو من الكاذبين وإن كان قميصه قد من دبر فكذبت فكذبت وهو من الصادقين. He said a cousin of the woman, a relative of this woman, سبحان الله والله works. He bared witness. He said. Let's look at his shirt. If it is ripped from the front, then he will be the liar and she will be the truthful one. Meaning that he came to seduce her and she tried to struggle and so maybe she ripped his shirt from the front. But if his shirt is ripped from the back, then she is the liar and he is the truthful one. So he's running away and she ripped it. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَمَّا رَأَى قَمِيصَهُ قُدَّ مِن دُبُرٍ قَالَ إِنَّهُ مِنْ كَيْدِكُنَّ إِنَّ كَيْدَكُنَّ عَظِيمٌ يُوسُفُ أَعْرِضْ عَنْ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرِي لِذَنْبِكِ وَاسْتَغْفِرِي لِذَنْبِكِ إِنَّكِ كُنْتِ مِنَ الْخَاطِئِينَ When they saw his shirt ripped from the back, the Aziz, the minister, said to his woman, This is part of your own plot. You are in the wrong. So seek forgiveness from your Lord. And O oh Yusuf, just forget about it. Forget that it ever happened. Subhanallah, the minister, instead of telling everybody, my wife is at mistake and he is innocent. He said to her, you've plotted 
Just ask God to forgive you. And oh Yusuf, can you please just keep it low key? Because you know it's detrimental. Sure, the honourable woman, the um, you know the woman of an honourable man, she committed such a lustful behaviour. Also her slave. Please keep it quiet. And he said to Istaghfiri Rabbik, ask your Lord to forgive you. Yes, they did worship idols, but Subhanallah, even them on the religion of Abraham, they knew that there was only one God who actually forgave the sins and punished. So that he said to her, ask your only one God to forgive you. She didn't do so. She went away and still plotting and planning. Allah says in the Quran, if you thought that it got that bad, it got even worse. Allah says in the Quran that a group of noble women, women who also had high status, because you see, if you're of high status, what do you have? People, friends of high status as well, if this is what you like. So you hang around with the rich people, you hang around with the noble people, if, you, if, if this is what's important to you. So the wife of the Aziz, or the woman of the Aziz, she had noble or so-called rich, famous, popular, or powerful women around her. These women, they started to backstab her. They started hanging around and say, whispering, hey, have you heard about the, the woman of the Aziz, of the minister? She's seducing her slave. She's seducing her slave. <laughs> She's crazy. She's gone nuts. Who seduces their own slave? Listen to the plan of Allah, how it's working here, subhanAllah. فَلَمَّا سَمِعَتْ بِمَكْرِهِنْ Allah says, when she heard about their plots and their slander, أرسلت إليهن. She sent a messenger to call them. She invited them. It says that she invited them to her house as guests. And they had a feast. So she had food and she brought out some desserts. And she brought out fruit without cutting them. Fruit that needed to be cut. So she placed knives for them to cut. You know, when someone comes as a guest, you place a bit of apple, a bit of oranges, a bit of pear, and sometimes we give cutlery to the guests for them to serve themselves, help themselves to the fruit. So this is what she did to these noble women. As they were sitting there, eating and enjoying and cutting their fruit and eating, she dressed up, she told Yusuf to dress up in a beautiful garment. He became out well-groomed. وَقَالَتِ اخْرُجْ عَلَيْهِنْ she requests, she commanded him to come out. So he came out. Allah says in the Quran, something miraculous. Allah says, وَقَالَ تِخْرُجْ عَلَيْهِنْ فَلَمَّا رَأَيْنَهُ أَكْبَرْنَهُ وَقَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنَّ وَقُلْنَ حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا هَذَا بَشَرًا وَقُلْنَ حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا هَذَا بَشَرًا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ When they saw him, they gratified him. Allahu Akbar! Like that. It's like screaming out with dismay, with amazement, with shock. And they said, حَاشَ لِلَّهِ No way! This is not a human being. He is an angel sent down from the heavens. As they were looking at him, they became so paralyzed that they couldn't even feel their own bodies for a moment. They became paralyzed, hypnotized, to the point where as some of them were cutting the fruit, Allah says they cut their hands repeatedly. <laughs> they're cutting the fruit, so they're enjoying themselves, and the man comes out, and then they look at him and they forgot that they were still cutting away until Allah says they began to cut their skin, their palms. Not once, qatta'na is plural, is a plural verb. Qatta'na, over and over, twice, three times. How beautiful was he? When the woman of the Aziz saw them do this, she turned to them and said, فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي لُنْتُنَّنِي فِيهِ this is the one you blamed me because of him. And yes, I'm the one who seduced him. Fastasam, he resisted. But look what happened to you. Haha. <laughs> you cut your hands and you're blaming me. This is to illustrate to you, brothers and sisters, the enormity of the situation. Yusuf alayhi salam was given a greater test than all of us. And it is seduction right here. First it was 
abandonment from his family, second, slavery, third, pain and torture, and now seduction. He has been tested almost with all the tests that we run away from. Except for death, it hasn't approached him yet. And here he is. What happened? Just to end this, inshallah, and conclude it. The women who saw him, they began to try and convince Yusuf to agree with what the woman wants. You know what she said? If he doesn't do what I am commanding him to do, then he is going to be imprisoned and among the lowest of the low. So the women came to him and said, please do what she wants. We don't want you to be in prison. We don't want you to be like, you want to be, to be noble, listen to her. So now they're trying to seduce him to, to accept. Yusuf السلام, ran away from them. And he went into the darkness praying to Allah night. In the night prostrating over and over and crying to Allah. Qala, Rabbi sijnu ahabbu ilayya mimma yad'oonani ilayhi. Oh my Lord, the prison is better to me than what they are calling me to. The prison, the dungeons, the rats in there is better to me than what they are calling me to do. Which men do that today? Oh my Lord, if you don't deter them away from me, with my weakness as a human being, I may, I may fall prey to what they're asking me. I'm weak, oh my Lord. I need you to protect me. I'm weak. Allah says, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ his Lord responded to him. He protected him from them by what? By making him enter the prison. Subhanallah, a dungeon is a bad place. No one wants to enter it. A Muslim should not wish for it. But in this circumstance, it's justifiable. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayh, when he was imprisoned because of what he was calling to the truth, he said, if they imprison me, it is a khalwa for me. It is a seclusion with my Lord. This is how a believer is. He brings out the best from the greatest misfortune that other people think it is. People think it's a misfortune. To the believer, it is success.